Honey? Ugh, what? I can't believe this. Can't believe what? I can't believe I've been married to the most amazing, wonderful, beautiful woman for the past two years, six months, and three days. I love you. I love you too. I got you these flowers and this tiny teddy bear for no reason at all. Here. Ugh, I love them. They're adorable. You're so sweet. Here's some chocolate. What? What? What is it, sweetie? Did you go to the mall yesterday and purchase clothes? Yes, I did. You stayed so far under budget. It's amazing. Thank you. What movie are we gonna watch tonight, sweetie? Hopefully one of your favorite romantic comedies. That sounds wonderful. But I thought instead we could watch sports. Fine. Also, I made this steak dinner for you. That is my favorite thing to eat while watching sports. Here's your steak knife. Have a great day at work, sweetheart. Thank you, I will. You're the air that I breathe. Oh, thank you, you're the best. You are. We are. Love you. Love you too. service.
just believe that no matter where you've been, you're just one step away from me, and a step away from free, and my story be the proof that anyone can be changed. Change my weeping to rejoicing and my guilty into grace. Change the list of wrongs behind me into a past erased. Change my wounded into healing and my broken into praise. It's a miracle of mercy that I'm standing. everyone today? How is everyone in the Lord today? Not so good? It's good to be here together as a family and today there's going to be a focus on family um, both in the message and, and in everything else and so uh, we just want to rejoice that we are together we are one in the Lord. Now, if you have a mobile device, I would ask if you would uh, turn it down or turn it off, whichever you prefer, just so we don't uh, interrupt people as they worship. Um, I would also uh, welcome all our guests who are here that I haven't seen before. And uh, you're a blessing. And uh, just remind you that on the bulletins, there's this little attachment at the back that you can tear off. And uh, if you want to fill that out, and so we know that you visited us, uh, so that we do, if you have prayer and so on, uh, just the offering plate uh, as it goes by. And, uh, and welcome. Let's uh, continue our worship. By, uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing rejoicingly. Almighty Father, we thank you for the blessing of this gathering. We thank you for your call in our lives and in our hearts. We thank you for the call to Jesus. We thank you for the transformation that you have enacted by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are a God who saves and that you are a God who draws his people together as family. We thank you for those around us and may we together as one bless you in this service as we rejoice in you and bless us as we leave this service continuing our rejoicing in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Would you uh, stand uh, with us as we sing to our risen King?
bonds of love. We are the family of God. Let us continue our singing. yourself, Rhonda? Old war wound. Sebastian, you're back. I'm so excited to see you. How does it feel being the only one here? <laughs> the end of March break. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's okay. Well, we do have other visitors here they're just a little too shy to come up and see us but i'm happy to see you back and the other kids will be back probably next week they're still recuperating from march break but we missed you we're happy to see you back all right so I you think know we what? should all say hi to sebastian hi yes hi sebastian. <laughs> there you go <laughs> all right you know what we are just gonna pray and then you'll be able to head back to your class with miss evelyn all righty Okay, and Lord Jesus, we again want to say thank you that we can be here in your house, Lord, on this beautiful day, just worshiping you, worshiping with our church family, Lord, and we think of our children and our youth uh, and those that are away today, Lord, we tr uh, pray that you will just be drawn near to them in a very special way, Lord, and um, just let them know how much they are loved by you and by us. And we look forward to having them back again next week. And we are so happy to have Sebastian back. And we are extremely happy to have our visitors that are here from Doug and Leona's family. And we just ask your blessing on Sebastian and his lesson with Miss Evelyn, and uh, especially on the message that Pastor Dan is bringing to our adults. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Come on over this way, buddy.
Good morning, church. How do you feel? I feel fine. I'm here for announcement. And um, shine the light Bible study tonight at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall or on Zoom. Ladies Bible study this Tuesday, March 19. I've been 72 years and one day. Yeah. Wow. At 9.30 a.m. Prayer meeting this Wednesday, March 20 at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall or on Zoom. Board meeting this Thursday, March 21 at 7.30 p.m. Good Friday concert, Friday, May 29 at 10 a.m. Lunch afterward, please see Susan to sign up. Thank you. I just, uh, if you could turn me on. Uh, I just have uh, one other announcement that I wanted to make. Um, actually, I, I have a couple announcements. One is that um, um, someone has asked me about membership. Uh, and a membership class, and uh, we are now starting a, a course called Connect 101, which is going to be part of that process. Uh, Connect 101 allows you to come, and uh, well, if, you're, if you're new to the church, it gets you to know a little bit more about the church and how the church works, how, you know, I find people sometimes, they they're in the church, but they don't quite know who to talk to about things and so on. So this is an opportunity to get to know that. We'll talk a little uh, um, about the gospel. We'll uh, talk a little a bit about what our denomination is about and so on. So uh, we haven't set a date. What I'd like is if there's anyone here interested in something like that, possibly even interested, come see me after the service. Come to the front and uh, let's have a chat about that. And we'll see um, what we can start. I'm thinking sometime in April it would be good to start that. Also, I have, um, we're putting the baskets together, uh, the baskets, we're using bags actually for the welcome to our neighbors over there who are coming in. And uh, if there's anyone who could help us out just with uh, um, you know, taking bags over and welcoming people to the neighborhood, or just putting bags together, could you please let me know, um, email me or, or talk to me. Email is always better because my memory isn't as good as it once was. And uh, that would be great. Thank you. Now let's uh, pray as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings. Almighty Father, Lord, we are thankful to you for the blessing you give us every, every day to provide for us, to from day to day give us our needs. And so now we just give a little bit back of what you've given to us as you've asked us to. Not because you need it, because we want to glorify you and to uh, promote your kingdom work in this church community as you've set us here as a lighthouse. We pray your blessing on these tithes and offerings. May they be used to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to take some time to pray. Pray for 
well, pray our thanksgiving, which we've already been doing. But I know, Can you thank God too much? I don't think so. We want to pray for the needs in this church community, but we want to go beyond that. We want to pray for the needs of the community at large, who God has set us here to care for. So let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty Father, once again, we open our prayer with thanksgiving. We thank you that we can come before your throne of grace and bring our hearts to you and bring our longing to you and bring our cares to you, including the cares for others. How many times did Jesus heal people because of the faith of someone else? So we come before you in faith, knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer us. And for that, we are extremely thankful. And we know, Lord, that in our lives, there are needs. And you know what those needs are. You know those challenges, Lord. You know our struggles. Our struggles of sin, our struggles in, in the world and with the world. And so in our hearts, each one of us, with our own problems, lift them up to you. Pray, guide us that you would heal us if we need healing, that you would protect us, that you would help us to grow in you day by day. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters here at Connect Community Church. We pray for each other. And sometimes we don't know each other's needs, but we still lift them up to you, Lord. Because you have called us to be a family who cares for each other, who loves one another. And Lord, we pray for each other's families as well, some of whom are traveling right now, like our, uh, the Sanchez family. And we pray for your watch care over them and all of those who are traveling. And we pray also for our family who have not come to faith in you, Lord, for whatever reason. And we pray that you would come upon them, that your spirit would come upon them. We pray that you would bring the power of your spirit into their lives. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to say the words and have the opportunity to say the words that will bring the gospel in a way they can understand. We also pray, Lord, that you would bring other people into their lives, Christian people, born-again believers, to speak into lives, the lives of our loved ones, and bring them faith. We pray that also for the world. We pray that you would use us mightily to share the gospel. We pray for your kingdom to grow through this church, and through the church, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, especially those who are persecuted. We pray your watch care over them, Lord. We thank you for the testimony of those who stand firm in the faith. Though they face torture, imprisonment, 
death. We thank you for the voice of the martyrs. Lord, we also want to pray and lift up those who are feeling lonely. Those who are dealing with depression. Lord, we pray that they would be guided by you to seek the help that they need. We also pray that you would give us opportunities to speak into people's lives with love and with caring. To enfold people who need enfolding. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with homelessness. The need of a home, a roof over our heads is great. And we know that you've answered these prayers for many in this, in this church, sitting here. But then there are others I know who are in need, and we pray for them. We lift them up to you. We pray they will find that perfect place where they can be blessed and be a blessing. We pray that also for people who do not have jobs and are seeking them. We pray for those who are struggling in their work. Lord, we especially want to lift up families to you today. Pray for those that are being challenged, that might not be fragmented, or homes that are broken. We pray for them. We pray for marriages to be strong. We pray for the relationship between parent and child to be precious. And that love prevail, your love prevail. May you enter into that home powerfully and make a difference. Lord, we want to lift up um, our brother Tim Whitehead as he heads up the ministry of Galcom. And we, we see that Galcom is having some difficult issues with licensing here in Canada. We pray that you would make the way for, for radios in Quebec to, to be used, to be acceptably used, so that it can reach many with your gospel. We pray for the challenges they have with with costs rising, as it is for everyone, and with the increase of red tape in countries around the world. We pray also, Lord, including Canada, Lord. We pray also, Lord, for um, Thanksgiving, for the fact that uh, they have um, this training in Tanzania. And we pray that goes excellently, that they will be used, these people, to bring your gospel through their radio uh, to, to, to their respective countries. Lord, we want to lift up the nation of Brazil. We realize that nine-tenths of the country would say they are Christians. But we know that Maybe only a quarter would call themselves evangelicals. And among all of those, we know that there are fewer who are truly born again. We pray that your gospel truths would permeate through the nation of Brazil. But it would also reach out to the tribal people who have not heard your gospel. We pray for the missionaries and translators who travel to these remote places that they might share the gospel, that they might write the um, Bibles that need to be translated in various languages. We just pray, Lord, for a revival in Brazil as we pray constantly for a revival here in Canada and even here in our church. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering them according to your good and perfect will. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name.
Amen. We would like to do one more song before we go into our word. Would you stand with us, please?
You may be seated. Well, now for the time you've all been waiting. As we open the Word of God to Matthew, Matthew chapter, oh, there it is, chapter 19, and we're going to read the first 15 verses of chapter 19. And this is the word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and, and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Then children were brought to him that he, brought, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Almighty Father, as we prepare to look at your words here that have been prepared for us from time immemorial, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, open every aspect of us, our very souls, that we might receive what you would say to us, apply it to our hearts, and use it to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my... Bible, which is the English Standard Version, or the excellent superb version, as I like to call it, is, uh, has this entitled, the verses from uh, um, 1 to 12, entitled, Teaching About Divorce. But I'm not in agreement with that title. Now, that title isn't gospel, so I can do that. Because I think this is more about marriage than about divorce. I mean, it is about divorce. There is divorce related to it. But I think far more the focus of this passage is on marriage. And God's look here at marriage in the light of the issue of divorce is what Jesus is doing. And so this message is entitled, Marriage Matters. And yes, a double entendre is intended there. And we come with a, a prodding question from the Pharisees. And we remember the Pharisees are legalists. They are, um, much of their time is focused on the uh, synagogues 
that have been popping up in the last uh, few centuries. Um, I'm not that they wouldn't do the things that they are supposed to do at the temple, but theirs was about the law. And not only the law of the scriptures, but the law of the traditions of the Satan, which they also followed. That was the Pharisees. The Sadducees were far more focused on temple issues. And these Pharisees come, and they come with this prodding question. Now, Jesus is just entering Judea. And in the Gospel of Matthew, this is happening for the first time. Okay? Now, we know from the other Gospels, he went to, to um, Judea more than once. But Matthew is presenting his history as a, a passage from Galilee to Judea to the cross, to Jerusalem to the cross. Um, and you might say, well, that, that's not right. That's not historical. Well, we got to understand what history in the ancient times was. History was relating the past, but the idea of chronologically listing everything was not nearly as important in classical history of the day. Far more important was the thematics of it. So all of what we read in Matthew is true, but in Matthew's perspective, he brings us to Judea after we have all of the Galilean ministry. And we also know that as he enters Judea, that it's a time of extreme testing as well as extreme teaching as Jesus heads towards the cross. And the first challenge that is brought to him is this question about divorce. And I'd say that question has two parts to it. And the first part of this question, is it lawful to divorce your wife? Very simple question. It is a yes or no question, is it not? Can you divorce your wife? The second part expands on it really, and says, can you divorce your wife for any cause? Are there things you can divorce your wife for, things that you can't? That's their question. And you notice that it's all one way, right? It's the husband divorcing the wife. There's nothing about the wife divorcing the husband. And that was just the society of the time and the culture of the time. And one might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right. That's not according to the way the world works now. And I suggest that whether it's fair or not doesn't matter because the way God sees things, it really becomes moot. It becomes a moot point. So Jesus answers the first, this first question, but he doesn't answer it with a discussion regarding divorce. Really, he talks about it with a discussion looking at marriage. And so he points out from the scriptures that God was created, created man in his image. Male and female, he created them. It's interesting, but there are some ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities that would say that a woman doesn't have a soul. Her soul is, comes with her husband's. And that is totally, I just lost part of my glass, uh, that is totally different from what the scriptures would have us know. Male and female, he created them in his image. So we know that male and female are equal. But male and female also have an equal expectation in marriage. And we want to know what that expectation is. So Jesus goes on. Therefore a man shall leave his... This is from Genesis 2, 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and, and, and uh, hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now Why? Why does 
God say that? Why is marriage like that? Well, marriage is like that because, and we've spoken of this before, marriage is in itself and part of the image of God. It is a unity of more than one. God is three in one. And a marriage is two in one. One flesh. If this is true, and if his la last statement on this thing is that um, whatever God has joined together, let non met not man separate. Now he's talking about any, he's not talking about someone else, just some, it's just humanity. What therefore God has Join together, let the human let humanity not separate it. So where is the legality of divorce in that statement? Nothing, even ourselves, should separate our marriage. That is God's view of marriage. It's an incredibly high view of marriage. We live in a society that has an incredibly low view of marriage. All you have to do is go to City Hall, get a piece of paper, and get married. You need witnesses. Two. And that's it. You don't have to be committed to a long-term, lifelong marriage, you don't have to. You just go and you get married. But that is not God's way. And we see that the Pharisees really don't accept his answer, just like many in the world today don't accept his answer. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on a second. Moses, you know, our lawgiver, he allowed divorce. And remember, Moses, to the Jewish people and, and really to us in the Bible, he was God's mouthpiece to Israel. God spoke to the people of Israel through Moses because they didn't want to speak to God directly. They begged that they don't speak to God directly. You can read that in the book of Exodus. So, what about that, Jesus? What about that fact? And Jesus points out that the whole thing about divorce isn't about God. It's about sin. It's about the hardness of your heart. It shouldn't be sought out. No one should enter into a relationship with another person thinking, well, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to leave. If you enter into a relationship with a sexual uh, perspective, it is, should be with the mindset that this is going to be a lifelong commitment. That's God's high view of marriage. So Jesus points this out. Now what's this say about the Pharisees pursuing this question? If marriage is a lifelong thing according to God, as Jesus has pointed out, and divorce is more about sin than about marriage, why are the Pharisees doing this? Well, we know the Pharisees are testing Jesus. They want to sort of trip him up. They never were able to. They might have thought they won in their own minds. But the truth of the matter is Jesus answered biblically. And the only cause for divorce, according to the Lord, is when that intended unity 
is actually broken. That's what happens when adultery occurs. That's what happens when a divorce occurs. What you've done is taken the unity, the image of God's unity, and you've broken it. And adultery is a cause for divorce because of that broken unity. It's no longer the image it should have. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, there should be a longing never, ever, to destroy that image. That is, to us, or ought to be, sacrosanct. That's one of the reasons why when I do a, a, a biblical marriage, a, mar- yeah, a marriage Bible class, we talk very much about the covenant. Right? We talk about the covenant. You can nod. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> there is a you, you, need, you, you need an understanding of what that relationship you're entering in is. It's important because it's the way of the Lord. And it grieves the Spirit, it grieves God when that unity is broken. And that's why God still sees that unity from the start. The truth of the matter is, if you've entered into a sexual relationship with someone for the first time, before God, that would be like marriage. Because that's what sexual relationships are about. That's a sobering point. And then he talks about singleness because the disciples, <laughs> look, if that's marriage, then who would want to be married? Which I find very interesting. You know, because again, they're looking at the question of divorce. I can't divorce my wife. Oh, what if I don't like her? What if she drives me crazy? What if she's a terrible wife? What if? Do you know, it's interesting. I, I, re- I read somewhere that, there's a, that in the law, if a wife, in the, in the Talmud, if a wife burns the toast, that's cause for divorce. How many divorces would there be in the world? (laughs) So, and of course that assumes the wife's making the toast. Um, what, What is phenomenal is how high God looks at marriage. And how low, and we read that in Malachi, what God thinks of marriage. Elsewhere he says, I hate divorce. in the midst of talking about the divorce between him and Israel because of their disobedience, because of their adultery. And even in the midst of that, he hates divorce. So the disciples are wondering, well, man, uh, uh, should I get married? Some of them were. Peter certainly was. Uh, because you need to remain faithfully together till death do you part. That's quite a commitment. And Jesus talks about those who make that commitment. And he says, in, in, in not, I'm not quoting from scripture now, but in essence, there are some who are born impotent or infertile, There are some who are born like that. There are uh, people who are made to be eunuchs. 
by losing certain parts of their body. That happens today, by the way, but it was much more common in the days of Jesus. If you were a servant in a house and you were dealing with the women of the house as a male, you would only be able to do that if you were a eunuch. But then he says that there are those who become eunuchs for the sake of the Lord and the kingdom. In other words, people who remain faithfully single. Faithfully single. Singleness and purity for God's sake is not a bad thing. It's in fact a very good thing. But we got to remember that that only works under certain circumstances. And Paul gives us a little bit, and sorry, my glasses are broken, so I'm going to read this as best as I can without. Maybe I can use one lens, I don't know. Um, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read from verses 6 to 9 and then 32 to 35. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of the other. What is he talking about? He's talking about marriage in this context of the passage. He's talking about how he is single and he wished others could be. And if we go on then to verse 32, we read, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. What does that say? Well, one of the things it says is we should not push people into marriage. That is inappropriate. There is this sense coming out of the Old Testament where it says, be fruitful and multiply, that it is your duty to marry and uh, have children. And in fact, more than two children, because then you're just replacing yourself. But I think we have enough people in the world now. And I think, yes, there is a place for fruitfulness. And there are people who have five or six or seven children. So we're good. But God says... That if someone is single, a believer, longing to serve the Lord in their singleness, let them do it. It's a gift. It's not a curse, it's a gift. And there was one caveat that he writes about, and that is that if you're going to burn, in other words, if you're going to be lustful, if you can't do that without sinning, then you should get married. That, that is Paul's word on that. And that is God's way of looking at things. Because we do not want to sin. So singleness is not a bad thing. But it's also not a bad thing. It's a good thing if it's done in the way God has put it together, which is for a lifelong covenantal relationship. Now, the natural product of marriage is what? Kids, children. And Christ valued children. He used children in his, when he was speaking to people. We saw that. He took a child and said, you need to be like one of these to enter the kingdom of heaven. We sing that song. Well, we don't sing that song. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Do you know what? That is true. He does. And he, he did in his lifetime, uh, his incarnation. And so when we see the disciples saying, no, 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 no. Our teacher is busy. He hasn't got time for children. What does Jesus say? 
I certainly do. There is this tendency. I mean, in the 19th century, you would see people who would send their children out of the room. Like, ch children should be seen and not heard. Was, that's a Victorian thing. When you would barely see, you'd see your children for 10 minutes. The, the, the nanny would bring them in after dinner or something, and you would see them, and, say, and, and that's it. Do you think that's God's way? No, it's not Jesus' way. Why? Because children are part of that unity. The family is one. Husband and wife are one. Family is one. Now, at one point, my sons, if they are not blessed with the gift of singleness, may find someone who they will marry. And God willing, they will marry in the right way with a covenantal relationship. One. But they will always be family. Right? Not only that, but because they are one, my family grows. Because their wives are our family too. One flesh. Do you think God has a high view of marriage? Do you think God only on divorce? No. Marriage is first and foremost about God. I don't think people realize that. Marriage isn't about relationship. I mean, it is, but it's not primarily about that. Primarily, first and foremost, it is about God. It, in, in the unity of the family is projected the unity of the Godhead. And to tear it apart is to mar the image of God. And that's the same as murder. When you murder someone, when Abel mur or Cain murdered Abel, he murdered someone in the image of God. And God responded, the blood of your brother cries out to me. But if you have a marriage where a husband and wife become one flesh, and you tear that flesh apart, have you not murdered the image of God? Marriage is between a biological man and a biological woman. That's a very unpopular thing to say these days. But that's what the Bible says. This is what we believe as a church. And this is the stance of our denomination, the Associated Gospel Churches of Canada, which we are a part of. And we need to stand firm on that. It is the spiritual perspective of things. Certainly not the current legal perspective. Now, if someone... Like if a, a, a married male, male couple, same-sex couple, came into this church, do we welcome them? Yes. Do we love them? Yes. Do we affirm them in their relationship? No. But we can still love them. And we can let the Holy Spirit work in them and, well, on them and through us. And that's important too. Now, when it comes to these issues of, you know, divorce and, and marriage and remarriage and, and so on, it becomes very difficult because the, the, the circumstances now are just, they're, they're a mess in so many families. 
And people come to me, and, and they may have been married before. And how do I determine whether they should be married or not? And, uh, you know, you want to do it biblically, but the point of the matter is it's already not God's best when these things happen. And so how do we respond to that? Well, we respond to each situation dealing with these sound biblical judgments, but we also deal in God's grace and mercy and love, and we look for God's best, not our best, not their best, God's best going forward. That is the plan. That is how we do things, and it's going to be different for everybody. Are there times when we feel that someone shouldn't be married? There is. And if you want to talk more about that with me, you always can. Again, we want to remember that singleness is not something to be shunned. It's something that should be encouraged for those who can do so in purity. It's a special gift. But for all else, marriage should be recommended. If you don't have that gift of being able to be single in purity, then get married. Lust is a sin. Remember what Jesus said, even if you think lustfully about a woman in your heart, you have sinned. You've committed adultery in your heart. Now this all sounds very, very harsh. And maybe it should. But as I say, already there's a lot of mess in marriages. And the culture has created those messes powerfully. And what are we going to do about it? Well, once again, we do it in grace and in mercy, using good judgment. Because, man, if God held against us everything that we did, who would be safe, as David put it? So we want to recognize that there is forgiveness in Christ. If we have put our hearts in Christ, if we put our faith in Christ, there is mercy and there is grace. But there is also God's will. And we want to balance that well and carefully because what we don't want to do is to ever treat marriage less than God thinks of it. Clearly, marriage is important to God. It's the heart of the matter. Family is important to God. Clearly, marriage is not to be lightly entered into or lightly lived out. That's that wonderful video of the two couples angrily loving each other. It's, it's funny, but it's sad. It's, it's a poignant thing because the truth of the matter is do we walk in our marriages in love, in concern? Am I cherishing Linda? Is she cherishing me? In her role as wife, is she submitting to me? And in my role as husband, am I caring for her wants and submitting myself to her needs? Is this happening? Clearly, singleness in, is, in purity is a wonderful gift for those to whom it's given. And finally, clearly, the breaking up of a marriage seriously grieves God and his family. This is true in our families. Each of us is true in the church family. We are a family, are we not? We've talked about that a lot. You are my brothers and my sisters. 
everyone in this room who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is part of my family. I love you guys. I know I've never said it, but I do. We, like God, must cherish marriage and the family it results in. We have to encourage those who are married, who are family. Are we encouraging each other and our families? We must strive to build up and encourage biblical marriages. We do that by teaching. We do that by preaching. But we can do that by, by offering sound, godly advice. Make sure it's godly, biblical. At the same time, we have to embrace those who in purity re remain apart and single for the glory of God. But in the end, let us all do what we do in love and in caring. Love of our families, love of each other's families, love of our whole church family. Because our church here is another reflection of God's unity. And as we worship with other churches, they also are a reflection with us of God's unity as we look at the whole of all believers as the body of Christ. And let what God has put together, let no man separate. Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty Father, Lord, these words are um, certainly challenging and convicting, and we thank you for them. We pray that uh, you will uh, um, have convicted those of us who need convicting. Teach us for those who need the teaching. Um, challenge us for those who need the challenging. But most of all, Lord, help us to view the issues of marriage as you view them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we are a church family, we thought we would finish with a song that we have all sung before that reminds us why we are Christians, how we are Christians. How is it we are Christians? The cheat sheet's there. It's by our love. Would you stand with me? We are
presence of the Lord in power and may you go in the power of the Spirit to do the will of Christ in the world. Go with his grace and his love in Jesus' name. Amen.